This presentation was recorded at the Best Practices for Pollinators Summit. For more information, contact pollinatorfriendly.org. Okay. Um, well, uh, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for joining. Um, looks like there's a, a good crowd in attendance, and that's really exciting. Um, it's been a great conference so far. Um, my name is Evan Larson. Uh, I'm a professor uh, at the University of Wisconsin in Platteville. I'm chair of our uh, Department of Environmental Sciences and Society. And um, I'm really uh, excited and pleased to be here, um, honored and humbled in all of these things to talk about fire. And this has been something that's been a uh, really important uh, guide to a lot of the work that I've done over the last years. Um, it has led to some incredible collaborations and some just am amazing learning opportunities. Um, and I think all of that's related to some really important work that um, hopefully uh, is of interest to folks who are interested in um, best practices for pollinators. So um, these webinars are always a little awkward because I can't see the audience. And so I'm I will dive in, um, and Laura, you can just rein me in uh, if we need to. So you are you are doing good. We are a captive audience. Okay, great. Um, well, so gonna activate. There we go. Now ready. Um, so kind of looking at, at this region uh, right now, I'm living down in uh, Platteville, Wisconsin. Um, I think that. Um, this work has really captured a lot of themes and, and threads of my own life and my own existence and has have pulled them together uh, in ways to me that have been really powerful. And um, I grew up in Malacca, Minnesota. Um, and so it's right at that boundary between the North Woods and the Southern Prairies. Um, here's an aerial photo uh, from, I think this one's 2017. And... Um, you can see right here, there's a little little white dot. That's the barn that my parents moved up there. Um, and then we're carving a home out of that. They moved the barn up on, in the 70s, bought 80 acres of land for a pretty good price, um, uh, tax forfeit, and decided to, to kind of carve out um, a life there. And so that's where I grew up. Um, we're going to talk about fire today. And it's interesting because I remember really vividly when we would go out and we would burn a meadow and you can kind of see a little meadow right around there. I think I've got a circle here. And uh, that was kind of my first introduction to uh, fire um, as a process, as, as something that's really valuable and important and good um, for a lot of reasons. And uh, it was really interesting when I looked at um, a kind of the longer term history to think about that landscape in the 1930s and how the woods that was normal to me um, was new in that space. And that that tiny little prairie, that little meadow that we were burning used to be part of a much, much broader landscape. And my parents have told me these stories many times about the old timers from Bach, a small community down south. We we'll talk about lighting a fire, and it would burn burn north all the way up to the um, to the river, to the Groundhouse Creek north of us. And that um, this feature right here, this is an esker, and um, that used to be one of the best uh, places to pick blueberries in the area. And then what was even more interesting? So right here in the middle of that esker, you see a black dot. Um, there was one time I was poking around out there, and uh, and that black dot, that's actually, a, that's, those are two red pine trees uh, that are growing out on the esker, and they were both fire scarred. And so what I realized through this is that as I as I kind of tell the story of, of this work, that I have had opportunity to work with on so many incredible people, and, and I guess in a way, transform my own understanding, um, is that my experience has actually been rooted in the same story for a long time. Um, <clears throat> And so to share a little bit more, so this is Malacca. Uh, when I went away to college, I went out to a school called Willamette University. It's out in Salem, Oregon. Um, really beautiful school. Giant sequoias on campus, which is pretty neat. 
going from Minnesota winters to these rainy, soggy, green, and flowery winters was really awesome. But it was this place um, that I was first introduced to the science of dendrochronology, uh, tree ring science. And the context of that work was this landscape that you're seeing right now. And so this is in the Oregon Cascades. This is on the, the slopes of Newberry Volcano, Newberry Caldera. And that's what those lakes are. They're up on the top of a mountain. And this volcano had a series of lava flows that came down, and that's the dark gray that you see kind of in the foreground. And looking at this, you can clearly see the impacts of, um, of long engagement with this landscape through clear cutting. All these patches, and you can see, you know, some little squares of force that was left um, to meet standards and these big clear cuts. But also right here, you can see in the middle of this lava flow, there are these patches of woods um, that hadn't been logged. And this is an area called the lava cast forest. Um, 6,000 years ago, lava flows came down and they isolated these old cinder cone deposits. Trees could grow on the cinder cones, but not on the lava, this ah ah lava flow. And so um, I was brought in for an undergraduate research project. Uh, I was recruited because I, had, I knew how to use a chainsaw. So thanks for that, mom and dad. And um, we were out on this landscape um, with a lot of different people looking at a lot of different aspects of how this landscape worked and specifically thinking, you know, if we fragment the landscape, how does that change how it works? Is it still a forest or is it a patch? Is it an island? Um, and when you look at these kind of from the lava, you can really see these are very distinct pockets of forest. And so um, my part of this was to help look at the history of fire. So this is a fire scarred ponderosa pine um, and kind of look at how fire moves across a fragmented landscape. And so that that in that way, we could understand how fire might work in a landscape that now has been fragmented through logging and roads and cities and all of these things. Um, beautiful landscape, really fun, met some great people, got to just breathe in that vanilla air off of the trunks of the ponderosa pine and the at, at sunrise is magnificent. And it was my first time being part of a, a scientific publication, part of this process. And it was really interesting because I was thinking about this talk. I thought back to this paper and right there, that word naturally jumped out at me. And, um, <clears throat> And thinking about, you know, why were we looking at this place, a natural landscape, and by that we meant not human, not manipulated by people, not affected by people. And there is this underlying implicit notion that by understanding the natural part, the part that's not human influenced, that's the good, right? That we can understand how things should be because we've taken people out of it. And that idea, I didn't realize at a time, has been really central to so much what I have done since, as I'm working through my own intellectual baggage, working from a Western perspective that maybe isn't capturing the whole in the way that we need it to. And so um, I have only done this a couple of times in a webinar where I can't hear you, so I don't know if this is going to work or not, but um, we're going to give it a try. We're going to do word association. So I'm going to say a word. And I want you to, you can close your eyes. Um, I can't tell if you do or not. So, um, but I want you to, if, if you're willing, when I say this word, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to develop a picture in your mind of what that word uh, suggests. What do you see? Um, and then I think we can use the chat. And so if you are so willing, I'll ask you to start populating the chat with, with what you see in your mind's eye when I say this word. You ready? Okay. The word is wilderness. 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 What do you see? Oh, good, it's working. And then just let it go for a minute here. Hmm. Oh, uh, Mary Penn already offered up what I was hoping. So I'll start just reading off some of these. So free trees, green, quiet, bears, forested mountains. I'll, I'll, I'll click on that one. Mm, um, we've got dew, we've got wild, we've got 
tundra or northern forests. Um, we've got wildlife running freely. We've got some deep woods, rugged terrain, big trees, expansive. How many of you have been to the Boundary Waters? Oh, there's Tina said BWCA. So, so far we're doing pretty good. We got mountains, clear lakes, all of these things, right? Um, the key and what Mary threw in there is that there's no people in wilderness. So it ties right into that idea of natural, of, of this world that is so beautiful as long as we can keep people out of it. And I'm really curious, how many of you saw this when you thought of wilderness? Um, and I ask because this is, this is a place uh, near and dear to my heart. This is a photo from the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Um, it is one of the landscapes that was preserved uh, with the establishment of the very first 1964 Wilderness Act and subsequently expanded um, in the 1978 Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Act. But this is wilderness, but yet here are people. Some Basswood Lake, for those of you who are interested. How many of you, when I said wilderness, saw this? <clears throat> I'm hoping that some of you are chuckling, and I'm hoping that some of you know it is. We can keep the interactions if you want to throw in the chat, but uh, here's the other hint, right? So that was the Holy Grail. This is King Arthur um, and the Knights uh, of the Round Table off to seek the Grail. Um, and for those of you familiar with Monty Python, this is a wonderful film. My favorite class at college was a class where we took the Grail legend and we followed it from its first emergence as the Black Cauldron, all the way up through this development of this cultural myth that shaped people's identity and understanding of who they are and how they relate with each other. Myths so important. Um, and what was really interesting is that when the knights were seeking the grail, the origin of that myth is that the king was sick. Because the king was sick, the land was sick. And the way to heal the king and therefore the land was to seek the grail. And so the knights, when they're marching off to find the holy grail, they're striking off um, and having these grand adventures. And um, <clears throat> one of the versions of the textbook, I can remember this word over and over and over and over, because the knights, when they would leave the castle to go seek the grail, where were they going? They were going into the wasteland. That was the name, Wasteland. There's a poem by T.S. Eliot called The Wasteland that embraces this part of the Arthurian legend, of the, of the Grail legend. And so all of a sudden I was like, wait a second, Wasteland, this is different. And so let's do that again, um, word association. I think you know what I'm going to say this time, but okay, so, so close your eyes. And now I'm going to say Wasteland. And I want to know what you see now. Desert War, Mad Max, no Reese's Brownfield. Oh, okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and put this up here because I'm pretty sure that we're capturing almost everything you're saying, right? And I like this because it's 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 a little more um, <clears throat> abstract, right? And so you know, wasteland, this this horrible horrible place that's full of death and decay, but not the good kind, right? And and so. Uh, what shocked me all of a sudden was to realize that when they said wasteland, they weren't talking about this. They were talking about this. Wasteland at the time of the Grail legend was talking about land that wasn't cultivated. It wasn't being used. It was wild. It was untamed. It was going to waste. And then all of a sudden, this just opens up this incredible flow of thoughts. Um, and I felt like just a little while ago, it was, it was really beautifully captured in this book, um, The Invention of Nature by uh, by Andrea uh, Wolf. Amazing book. Alexander von Humboldt, this Prussian royalty or, or, or noble, and he traveled the world in the, in the 1800s. And he, he was one of the first people in Western science to write beautiful passionate prose describing the the environment and he talked about um he talked about climate change how cutting the forest was changing local climates he talked about conservation he talked about just the amazing world that was all around us and and for all the good that that did what it also did 
was start to separate people from nature. And so his work, um, it's not as well known in the U.S. as it used to be. If you haven't read the book, read it. He was the most famous person in the Western world um, for a long time. He uh, inspired the romantic era of painting. Um, you know, Thomas Cole, the, this uh, sequence of empire, right? So again, like this wilderness showing this beautiful landscape, putting people as either minor or non-existence to exemplify the beauty of the world. Um, people like Charles Darwin were inspired by Alexander von Humboldt, carried his work all around. Um, John Muir uh, read Humboldt extensively. Um, Humboldt wrote Cosmos, which has then been transformed into the TV series. Um, Henry David Thoreau, also a huge fan of Humboldt. And so then when you get statement like this, that in wildness is the preservation of the world from the forest and wilderness come the tonics and barks which brace mankind. Um, you all of a sudden recognize that the roots of this idea that were so passionately described by Humboldt have now kind of taken over what we think about. And you take that notion of wilderness as empty, unpeopled, as good, as beautiful, and you apply it to something like manifest destiny. And all of a sudden, the, the problem of that idea becomes very evident. Um, I had the distinct pleasure of co-teaching a class uh, with Robin Kimmer once, and we were talking about models and how we understand world. And I had, I had showed this to talk about how this is a model of how people understand the world. And, and I'd gone forward, and, and she said, Evan, Evan, stop. Would you go back? And she walked up to the screen, and she turned and looked at this class of the Lido B. Platteville students, and she pointed at this woman right here. And she said, you know, this could be my grandmother. <clears throat> That's pretty heavy. But yet here is wilderness writ large, right? Is the unpeopled notion of a landscape that's empty that, that people are coming into to transform into good. And it's not until this goes rampant in the industrial era where all of a sudden we start protecting wilderness, it becomes this really beautiful and good thing that we think of today with all these positive associations. Um, and so to think about wilderness, the Boundary Waters is an amazing place to do this. It's quiet, it's empty, there's pines, there's fresh water, all of these things that you talked about. Um, Sigurd Olson, uh, you know, an advocate for wilderness, he talks about this is a place where your choices have consequence. And so don't paddle into the thunderstorm. That's a choice and you will, you will, um, experience the results of your of your choices right and that's why we go to these places to see these beautiful settings and to live in this really primal and rugged way and so it makes sense when you're in this space now you know that this is an area where the earth and community of life are untrammeled by man where man himself is a visitor who does not remain <clears throat> but we know that's not true um, this map shows you the First Nation reserves in Canada and the reservations in the U.S. of, of um, Anishinaabe communities who have long-term ancestral connections to this landscape. The border route is labeled there. It has been a travel route for millennia. We know people have been here. We know that there is photographic evidence of people in these areas tending this landscape. This photo is from northern Minnesota or Wisconsin in the early 1900s. It's titled Blueberry Camp. Notice the char on the trunks of this beautiful open pine forest. We know that um, knowledge has been shared with Western researchers up in Canada about Ishkore fire and how um, fire is a, is a spirit and agent and a part of these, these settings that when present in forests can help cultivate rich blueberry harvests. And for those of you who have been in this space, you also know that those blueberries are a pretty beautiful and wonderful thing. And now think about it as a food source that will get you through the winter. So wilderness. Um, and yet here we are, uh, you know, working from this Western mindset where we have these stories, there is this knowledge, it has been shared, and yet we still need to show quantitatively um, whether or not it's true. <laughs> and so um, this was the root of, of, of work up uh, in the Boundary Waters, um, spanned a decade and some. That's Lane up front, Liz Schneider, a grad student at the University of Minnesota at this point, and Ben Mathias, a former student of mine. 
striking off into the boundary waters to start thinking about wilderness, to think about people, to think about fire. And if these concepts and ideas um, can help us understand our place and open up opportunities for conversations and different understanding um, in valuable ways. And so we were looking at pine stands that you know might look like this from the water. Uh, and you go up and if you find trees like this, what you're looking at are fire scars. And so these are trees that a fire burned by um, and damaged the trees, but it did not kill them. Um, and if you look more closely, you might see something like this. And I believe you can see my cursor. And so what I'm going to do is looking at this right here, this line, that was the first time that a fire burned by this tree and scarred it, but didn't kill it. Here's the second. There's a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and a seventh and an eighth and a ninth and a tenth. Ten fires, at least, that burned by this tree and scarred it, but didn't kill it. And implicitly, we know then that those fires were not the raging conflagrations that you see on the news or even what we've seen in the Boundary Waters in recent decades. These were quiet fires. These were low severity fires to scar a tree but not kill it. Uh, because it's wilderness, we were not sampling any living trees. Um, but when we found stumps like this, um, hand tools, because it's wilderness, um, you can open them up. This has been a tree that's been dead for, for decades. <clears throat> and then looking at how the resin that's produced by red pine trees has infused that scar face um, so that the wood is still totally solid and you sand it up and you polish it. And all of a sudden through, this, through the techniques of cross-dating and dendrochronology, looking for that micro ring in 1804, the false ring in 1821, that false lakewood boundary in 1747, the dark lakewood in 1752, false rings in 1863 or four or five, you can start to piece together exactly when this tree was growing, even though it's been dead for quite a while. Um, from that, we now know that this tree growing on an island, a uh, small island in giant Lake Saginago, has the innermost ring of 1679. Uh, it has an outer ring of 18 or 1989, and that each of these curling lobes is when a fire burned by this tree, scarred it, but didn't kill it. So we know that in the year 1702, 1718, 1743, 1758, 1770, 1780, 1795, 1823, 1842, and then 1850 are years that fires burned by this tree, at which point the fires stopped. Knowing that this is wilderness, that must mean that lightning has stopped striking this island. And I used to say that and laugh, but then I also realized that this island is within the 1854 ceded territory. And that's <clears throat> significant. We also encountered trees that looked like this. Um, this is a culturally modified tree. So the bark was taken off. I always used to think it was Boy Scouts. Both Lane and Ben were Eagle Scouts, so I'd always make fun. I was like, oh, it's Boy Scouts hacking on trees. Um, and then we realized like, well, actually these are older than we think. You can see the tool marks at the bottom and top of the bark. You can see where the bark was peeled off. You can see tool marks that kind of etched it. And you can see that resin piling up along the margins of this tree. And it's interesting because I used to throw a quote up from Francis Densmore, who's a really famous ethnobotanist who was working in this region. She talks about how uh, the people would peel the bark off of trees and then go back to gather that resin. And that would be used to make gum. You would then patch or build your birch bark canoes. Yeah, so I used to call on this old book, but then I realized also like, or we could ask Jeff, <laughs> um, who's a master canoe builder up at Fond du Lac, and he'll tell you the same thing because the stories are still there. The knowledge is alive and very well. Uh, you can see the etchings on the scar faces where people used an awl to gather resin. And when these died and fell down, we had permission to collect samples. You can see the resin boiling on this one, even though it's been dead for 70 years or so. You sand them up, it's the same thing. <clears throat> and now we know that this was not in fact Boy Scouts, but that this tree actually had its bark peeled in the spring of the year 1800. We looked at forced demographics, tree ages over, over this broad region of the wilderness to get a sense of how the forest is changing over time. And so starting in the Boundary Waters, because it's such a quintessential landscape, this is what we gathered. So again, you'll see that border route, really important travel corridor. 
Uh, we scouted the shorelines of 211 lakes across the boundary waters. Every one of those blue lakes, we scouted the, sh the entire shoreline. Um, everywhere that we found a fire scar tree, we sampled it as long as it was a, a dead, a stump. Um, and so the red dots show you where we collected fire scars. Yellow dots are where we found um, or encountered culturally modified trees, 250 of those. We put in 32 age structure plots in which we cored about 1,100 trees to get a sense of demographics. You'll note that the uh, abundance of samples occurs along the border route, and yet there are also some pockets away from that where you have pretty intense uh, uh, evidence of fire. <clears throat> if we look at the data that emerged from this effort, right? So the cluster on top are trees that were growing away from the border route. The cluster of gray lines on the bottom represent um, each one of those gray lines is one tree ring sample. Um, those are the trees that were collected along the border route. Every red dot that you see indicates a year where those trees recorded a fire event. So there's a lot of fire. This is the cumulative number of fire scars that we're on, we found across the study area. When we lay on the peel scars, they line up almost exactly, both in space and time, with those fire scars. Um, laying on uh, early written accounts, um, uh, 1736, this is a landscape that was contested between the Anishinaabe and the Lakota, um, and that dispute was mostly settled for this area in the early 1700s. Um, later on, the Nelson Act um, was followed up the Dawes Act, but the Nelson Act required all off-reservation Anishinaabe to be removed uh, to the White Earth Reservation on the west side of the state. It's not that everybody did it, but that's a pretty significant impact. Um, and now all of a sudden you look at this and it is clearly not a, wi a wilderness. <clears throat> Why did fire stop if the people weren't all removed? This sign gives you a hint. So this is uh, from a journal that was written in uh, the early 1900s canoe trip along the border route. So this photo is from 1908. Um, if we look close, this is on the border route. It forbids setting fire to the woods and forbids leaving any fires unextinguished. At risk of a fine of $5,000 or imprisonment for two years. In 1906, my collaborator, um, Melanie Montano, who has ancestors who were jailed for setting fires, suggests this is a death sentence, right? <clears throat> for subsistence. Um, engagement with the land. How do you how do you go about setting fires if this is the risk? So we effectively untrammeled the landscape according to the Wilderness Act. And then the question is, what happens, right? How does that landscape start to change? So we come back to our fire chart, and now we add the age structure of the trees um, that we cord in all of those age structure plots. Uh, this is what the forest age structure looks like. There's a few key pieces that I want to point out. First of all, the fires stopped before Smoky Bear was on the scene. This is not fire suppression. This is a lack of ignition. Secondly, the tree establishment began to spike in the late 1800s. Again, Superior National Forest wasn't established till 1909. <clears throat> so this is something that happened when the fires stopped. If you look at this landscape now, you've got 250-year-old red pine that each carry 10 scars or more and they're surrounded by 100-year-old pines. If you were out west, and this was ponderosa pine, you'd talk about ladder fuels, right? These trees survived you know, more than 10 fires in their lifetime, but the next one that goes is gonna be hot and it's gonna scorch the crown. To give you a visual, here's a site. There's 70 culturally modified trees at this location. I'm gonna color code the trees based off of when they established. So the, um, the red will be the oldest, 1700s, Yellow will be 1800s, and then the blue is that 1900s cohort. And this is what it looks like. This used to be an open stand overlooking a pinch point in the fur trade. <clears throat> now it's a thicket. What we've come to understand from that scientific Western perspective is that this landscape um, it is not natural or pristine in that it's unhumanized, right? That it's actually expressing human engagement with this place. And it's not that people 
fundamentally shaped the landscape. It's not like there was a black spruce swamp that then, you know, people burned to make it into a red pine forest, but it's more so that they amplified the patterns that were already there. Um, this stand of red pine, when you burn it, it keeps it red pine. And like to think about this from a theoretical perspective, if this is the distribution of biotic communities from mesic, meaning wet, to xeric, meaning dry, in the boundary waters, in the absence of people, with people and fires, it's kind of like things were shifted into this slightly drier condition, earlier successional. And that within that, you're also creating these novel conditions um, that could be really important for maintaining biological diversity, um, pollinators, right? How many uh, pollinators are reliant on the, on the flowers and plants that move into these recently disturbed and early successional places? Um, so we threw a name on there, xerification. But that doesn't really do justice as just look at the forest, right? This forest is in a process of changing and it will not exist in the way that we think of the wilderness without substantial change. Red pine will diminish. And <laughs> the evidence that we have to really drive that home is that of the 5,540 square meters of regeneration surveys that we conducted in the most beautiful old growth red pine stands anywhere in the Lake States region. How many red pine babies did we find? We found eight. That's it. Eight. And the realization that these stands of red pine that were literally used to justify the Wilderness Act are not at all what we think and are in fact eco-cultural expressions of long-term engagement with the landscape. And so to find this, to encounter this in the boundary waters sets up this opportunity to have these conversations elsewhere. If we go across to Lac La Croix um, up in the Quetico, um, do we see the same things? Um, met with members of Lac La Croix First Nation Reserve, went out and toured a site, fire scars, culturally modified trees right next to a place where Danny was like, uh, yeah, that's where my grandpa's cabin used to be. And these are the stories that we used to have of this place. And then they go out there with, with children, kids who, who literally are living in this place that they're now excluded from because it's wilderness. Complicates things, right? Um, how about Itasca? Has anybody been to Itasca and seen these beautiful red pine stands at the headwaters of of the Mississippi River that Henry Schoolcraft discovered <laughs> after being led there by Oza Windip, right? And that in that setting, in the absence of fire, the same changes are taking place. The Brule River in Northern Wisconsin, a beautiful um, pine stands. Liam Martin is a grad student from the University of Minnesota who did a great fire history project here. Um, this is an incredible assemblage of cabins and properties. Calvin Coolidge used to uh, summer along the river here. And you'll note that these beautiful homes are surrounded by fire scarred red pine. Some of which have their faces chopped out and looking at this and thinking about how you could use that to actually gather resin, mentioning this whole thing to the person who was showing us around. I was like, oh yeah, they used to say there's an old Ojibwe guy who lived over there and made canoes, right? And so it's been interesting to be in all these places, but then it also became really personal. When I was doing a lot of this work, Initially, um, it was while I was on sabbatical and I was staying at my family's cabin up um, near, uh, kind of near Mille Lacs. Beautiful maple basswood forest, um, you know, spending a year and, and my kids were young. We were walking out to the school bus in the fall and then we were, we were skiing down the lake in the winter. And then as the ice got loose in the spring, but it wasn't open yet, we started walking through the forest. And... Uh, Lo and behold, after traveling all of this way up to the Boundary Waters again and again and again to see this story, could have looked at my neighbor's yard. <clears throat> Walking through the woods, come across, oh, fire scarred stump. This one is from a tree that has fallen into the narrows. I fished under this tree my entire life. And I finally got out and I walked up the trunk. <clears throat> Ten fire scars on this, surrounded by blueberries and poison ivy. And about 50 yards, 50 feet from the uh, Healthy Lakes Coordinator's house on the point of land. This is the best spot for fishing. Um, it's where you would want to be, right? And so now all of a sudden, 
this place that I've been going to my entire life is part of this story too. Fires in 1804, 1825, 1835, 1840, 1860, 1865, 1870, 1890, and 1898. That's the year that a resort went in, the lake, right, one lake over. So at my cabin, seeing those last few red pine above this maple canopy <clears throat> means that we're part of that story too. And it very distinctly told me that my kids were not the first ones to swim here. <clears throat> So the story has been emerging and it's been, it's been pretty powerful in a lot of ways. We've gathered tree ring evidence of fire history across this region. <clears throat> this doesn't even show all of the other uh, sites by other researchers. And, um, and the story that keeps coming is again and again and again. All the fires, all through the 1700s, and they stop. And you see this dramatic change. And, um, and the landscape changes following. But <clears throat> since we've been so good at being Western scientists and having heard these stories from indigenous communities for so long, like, yes, we engaged with the landscape through fire. Stockton Island, the name of that island in Anishinaabemo literally means place where the trees are half burned. <laughs> and yet um, it's really hard to translate that into action, into collaboration, um, into doing what we know is right. So it was a couple of years ago, uh, we decided let's, let's do this. If we are scientists, we have made these observations, we've developed our theoretical understanding, <clears throat> let's make a hypothesis and test it. Let's go to the head of Lake Superior. Hope some of you are familiar with this. This is a landscape that is near and dear to my heart. So we're looking here, this awesome satellite image out to the Atlantic Ocean, following the, the Great Lakes all the way up into the Midwest and that, that head of the lake right here. And this space is also really important in a lot of ways. And so um, what we're looking at now is a, a story that was shared in a book, the Mishomi's book. This is not the only version of the story, but it is a version talking about the movement of the Anishinaabe people from uh, the Atlantic Ocean along the Great Lakes. The, the arrows are showing, going, showing kind of like the movement of people along with seven stopping places um, that are really important uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. And so that head of the lake at Lake Superior, we are looking at like a mile from Spirit Island, which is up in the St. Louis River estuary. <clears throat> If you're up on the hill in Duluth and you're looking out and you see this long sandbar, it's the longest freshwater bay mouth sand spit in the world. It depends who you ask. Um, this is a, it's a beautiful place. There's Canal Park. You can go get your airbrush t-shirts and your expensive food, um, as well as really good smoked fish. Um, there's a, the Park Point Community Club. Um, so some people have been living out there uh, for a long time, really connected to that space. There's the Minnesota Point Pine Forest Science and Natural Area that's managed by the Minnesota DNR. The Army Corps of Engineers has land. On the far side, Wisconsin Point is mostly owned by the city of Superior, um, though they recently transferred some of the land that included a burial ground for the, uh, or cemetery for the, uh, the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa back to the band. Um, so it's this beautiful landscape. It also is steeped in story. Um, this was one of the most important gathering places for a number of the tribes in this area. Um, and they would get there and they would pick blueberries. It was a really, uh, it's central in that role and that identity um, for a lot of communities. And so we've got a natural area that is connected through oral history with blueberries. We know there's pines because it's Pine Forest Day natural area. So do we see the same thing? If we go out and ask the same questions, will we see the same result? Um, it was a couple of years ago now, depths of the pandemic, right? And the Wisconsin Sea Grant Program sends out a call. And in it, they are very interested in a project that targets justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion for underrepresented coastal communities. Um, we ended up going through a process, gathering a whole bunch of folks together uh, from the BAM, from the City of Blue, City of Superior, the um, uh, Lake Superior National Estuary and Research Reserve, um, whole bunch of folks to talk about if this is a place that we can do this work and can we do it well. Um, everybody contributed. We had this really beautiful uh, statement that 
basically says like, okay, we're going to do this work. We recognize the long-term history um, and we're going to see what it tells us. And we're going to accept these results with open mind and heart to guide what we do next. And then it came down to the crew. <laughs> <laughs> um, Emily, Val, Ashla, and Mocha, these are students at Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College who took a chance on us and opted in to uh, serve as research assistants to this project. Um, this was mostly done over the past year. It was awesome. We head out onto the points. We're kicking around. We're looking for fire scarred stumps. Mocha does a fantastic job of explaining the kick test, how to tell if it's solid or not. <laughs> um, wilderness so we use hand tools mostly we got to use chainsaw a little bit um, but we go in and find these stumps and we start collecting to see what we find um we found quite a few found a lot of poison ivy very few blueberries um on wisconsin point this is a place where there's well both points there's a lot of history um uh chief osagi was a signatory on the 1854 treaty who had a house out on wisconsin point he was a master canoe builder um, and so when we found a stump that looked like this, it's solid and we cut it and we realized that what we're looking at is the bottom edge of a peel scar. And Val says, holy, this could have been made by uh, Osagi. Like I could literally be holding a scar from my ancestor in my hands that's telling us the story of this place. Inventoried some of the big old trees, collected tree ring samples to, to do this process of cross dating. <clears throat> It was an awesome year. Um, I miss it already. We're we're moving on and 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 it continues to grow and it's it's been great. Um, these students are amazing. <laughs> we set up a lab at the estuarium. Thank you, Deanna Erickson and the whole crew. They were incredibly generous. Um, we took our samples into the lab so it could dry. Uh, the Duluth Makerspace gave us a deal on using their equipment, which was awesome. The community that came around this project was just really amazing. Students got to sand and look at stuff. And then we went, set up a lab at the estuarium to do the science of dendrochronology, right? So what does it tell us? <clears throat> That's the fireside. Uh, and it was so amazing once we started looking at these under the microscope, because you talk about bright knowledges. <clears throat> Here's an image of a fire scar tip. And so you could say this is the direction of the tree growth. This is the start of the 1804 growing season. This is the fire scar. This is the end of the growing season. And I would say, oh, that's a late season fire event. Bell might be like, that's nah, a blueberry burn. You could see the resin that's piling up behind some of these injuries. I'd be like, ah, this is excluding water to preserve the, the structural integrity of this tree. And they say, no, nah, that's canoes. <laughs> it's not a pith. It's when the creator shook the rattle and it's the beginning of the universe. <clears throat> it's not radial files of cells it's beadwork it's beautiful um, in addition to looking at the fire scars we gathered some cores from the dnr they very generously let us analyze some uh collections that were made uh, in a couple of earlier studies got together with the gada camp of uh, k-12 science students from uh from fond du lac and they got to become dendrochronologists look at data make graphs do all that stuff and so this is the collective of what we found red are fire scars um Yellow triangles are locations of culturally modified trees. Um, <clears throat> SNA boundaries. Uh, this is Minnesota Point on the left, Wisconsin Point on the right. What do we find? So here's where it goes. Ooh, drum roll, please. So these are the extent of the tree ring samples that we collected. On a gumming sing is Minnesota Point, Jagawama Kong, Nashi is Wisconsin Point. This is everywhere that those trees recorded fire events. This is a cumulative fire count. These are the peel scars. These are the treaties. 1842 seeded Wisconsin Point, 1854 included the lands on Minnesota Point. The critical part here is that fires stopped here earlier than anywhere else that I have worked. And it was the most immediate point of contact and directly impacted by these treaties. <clears throat> Here's the tree establishment. Immediately after the fire stopped, you get a, a pulse of regeneration. There's only been one red pine that's established in the last hundred years. The circles are hardwoods that are moving in. There's survey notes from the early 1800s that indicate there were no hardwoods at all on the points. We are now in a phase of transition. 
This is the age structure. Ironically, we also looked at the document that governs some of the management and the establishment of this SNA. One of the Gadda students read this at a public presentation that we gave, and, uh, and I quote, the uneven age nature of the red pine component of the stand, probably due to its presence on sand dunes, is unusual for a species that usually regenerates for a short time following fire. The fact that the stand is uneven aged suggests the stand will require little management to maintain the pine components of the stand well into the future. Equally important is the fact that much of the pine stand has maintained its ecological integrity in spite of a long history of human disturbance. She read these words and I said, is that what you found? And she looked at me and said, no, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. And not only wrong, it's not in spite of. This land maintains ecological integrity because of a long history of human disturbance, those fires. Photo that Lane encountered uh, up at the Trigg Family Museum in Ely. This indicates the world's largest log raft in the St. Louis estuary. You can see logs piled higher than buildings. Um, you also just so happened to capture the stand structure of Minnesota Point. It's a fire maintained woodland. The reason the blueberries were there is because it was open and it was maintained by fire. This is what it looks like now. This is what it looks like now. <clears throat> it's the same story again and again and again. Um, and it becomes even more personal because you look at some of these species that are just lingering in these little pockets of open. This is traditional tobacco. Melanie asked Val, what happens if you can't make your tobacco? It's like, I'm not Anishinaabe. So it's not just the pines that aren't regenerated. It's not just the blueberries that are now kind of withering in the shade of poison ivy. It's this whole system associated with, with that condition. And the history is right there. It is literally tangibly written on the landscape. Is it natural? Mm. <clears throat> so it's interesting to talk about these and to think about like, okay, great, so what, right? Um, there are so many implications that come rolling out of here and we can have a long conversation. Um, project is continuing in a lot of really good ways. I wanna emphasize some of the ways that the so what really, uh, I think is pretty powerful and pretty fantastic. So this is the location of the University of Minnesota Cloquet Forestry Center. And it was a few years back. That's the boundary of the Forestry Center. Um, and importantly, it is within the boundaries of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Reservation, Agaji Wanong. Um, it was largely established through land seizures through allotment. Uh, <clears throat> we can talk about that for a long time. What's interesting is on the left is a historical photo of what's known as Camp 8. 1920. On the right it was a similar photo taken in 2015. So again, the story happens again and again and again. Um, it was a few years back, went up there with a class of students from uh, UW Platteville, and we developed a fire history. Um, again, these beautiful big red pines surrounded by ladder fuels. Uh, this is the boundary again. These are all the locations that we collected a fire scar sample. Um, I'm going to shift over to the GLO maps from the 1840s. Uh, 1853 might be this one. And you may note that it's listed as Pine Barrens. And right over here, you have an old Indian village. Um, here's the fire history. Gray lines, tree ring samples, red are fire events. Fire, 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 fire. Force was established in 1909, and the fire stopped. We had these data, and we went up and we met with Jeff. And I didn't want to overspeak. And I said, Jeff, I think what a, my interpretation is that we are seeing an indigenous fire uh, stewardship, a relationship with this landscape moderated through fire that was disrupted. He looked at me and he said, you just tell me what I already know. <laughs> I appreciate your Western science. <laughs> this is not news. Reinforcing again that in the case of fire, Western science is very much catching up with indigenous knowledge in a lot of ways. Um, the beautiful piece from this is that that conversation has helped lead to action. Um, it was a couple of years ago now 
uh, collaborative uh, effort led by Fond du Lac, um, joined by the University of Minnesota, uh, band members from Leech Lake, Grand Portage, Mille Lacs, got together through a lot of effort in the forest and got fire back on the ground for the first time in decades. Um, and the largest burn that had been done in the history of the Cloquet Forestry Center. <clears throat> the outcome of this resonates with the name of the project that we had funded by uh, the Sea Grant program, which roughly translates to, we're all gathering around the fire. And it was that process of engaging around fire that that finally let people move past some of these really significant cultural barriers that are in place from long-term distrust, long-term disrespect, ignorance, abuse. Um, and it created a space to gather and do something that's really, really good. Um, <clears throat> this is a great sequence that Lane uh, captured right after the burn, June 13th, so a month later, September. It's a beautiful transition. <clears throat> Importantly, this work around fire has also contributed to an effort right now that is happening where um, the University of Minnesota is, it is releasing its claim to this land so that the band can reclaim it. And there again, fire has helped this process forward. <clears throat> so pollinators, right? <laughs> you look at a place like this and you think, is this natural? Is there a role for people? Um, I assume that probably almost everyone of you read this book. And in it, Robin talks about sweetgrass as this beautiful example. There's all these layered metaphors of weaving knowledges, weaving relationships, but also that really important lesson that if, if people ignore our relationships to the land, ignore our relationships with these other beings, like they will go away. Sweetgrass is an example. If you don't harvest or you harvest too much, it's gone. But if you get in relation with that plant, it will persist and thrive. Is it not the same with red pine? Are the fires set by the people that have been now carried in the bodies of these trees through time to lead to our lessons now that are finally moving this conversation forward, not examples of reciprocity? And again, it's not just the pine, it's all of the other species that need that fire to be in that space. And so we come back to this. And this was one of these things where I was like, huh, hadn't thought about that. So let's give it a try. So back to this migration story. <clears throat> I'm going to overlay a layer. This red blob of polygon. I'm curious if anybody has a sense of what that might be. Because we're online and I can't just ask, I will let you know that is the range of Apapuanagamak. That's red pine. Look at the arrows, look at the pine, it's the same. There's been a long-term relationship. I'm not saying that pine is there because of the people, but I am saying that the people in the pine are in relationship, and that this is important. <clears throat> so my challenge to you is <clears throat> if you think of the list of ways that people impact the land, right? And we could do the thought experiment. We don't have time, but you know, I would guess if I asked you, what are the impacts that humans have? You would say pollution, climate change, species extinction, like land use change, water, all of these things that we think about that people do that we think of as bad. Is there space to recognize that people are a part of this system and that our impacts can be good? And what sort of benefits can we really realize when we finally come into that space of thinking of ourselves not as just separate or above or or negative this connotation that anything we do is bad and therefore to protect the landscape we have to keep people out to recognizing that no we need to be in these systems but in them in a good way 
And so um, for me, the pines have been a really significant teacher along with, well, elders of all species and stripes. Um, and uh, this is a story I think that resonates with a lot of what we do and a lot of how we think about the way that we live in this landscape. And I feel like with that, it has some relevance to all you out there who are advocating for these pollinators and thinking about the ways that we can do that. Um, so the next time you hear wilderness, I would love for you to envision a trail crew walking side by side with elders and the elders are pointing and saying like, burn that, burn that, burn that. And in the wakes of the fires that are set, you see berries and medicines emerge in places where they haven't been for a hundred years. So that is what I have to share. Um, if you want to get some podcasts and other materials, you can click on that QR code. Um, but uh, otherwise, Lori, I think we've got a couple minutes for Q&A if we want to do that. Awesome. Thank you. So my email's burning up with people who are, you're bringing to tears <laughs> with the stories. Um, so stories and observation from the past are so important to conservation work. It, it seems like you found a way to use research and stories together. Um, do you think your work has influenced protections for the natural world or changed policy? Have you seen that happen? Um, I That's a great question. And a lot of the changes that you might want to see take a lot of time. Um, what I think is like a... a evidence that things are moving in a way that it's really good. Um, so the Sea Grant project, we conducted most of that work last year. I was on sabbatical and uh, the city of Superior, as far as I understand it, is in the advanced stages of planning a collaborative effort with Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa to return fire to Wisconsin Point. And so we're already seeing that kind of movement. Um, we also uh, have a new grant from the National Science Foundation that's going to be hosting a series of listening sessions across the Upper Great Lakes to kind of reach out and engage with additional communities to expand the conversation out. Um, and just in the conversations leading up to that project, it's been amazing at how um, people from all different backgrounds are really leaning into the conversation. Um, if you layer this on with the White House, uh, so two years ago now that they released guidelines for engagement with indigenous knowledge, um, White House guidelines for TEK um, and see that policy is rippling down through the federal government at the same time that there's a massive wildfire crisis task force that just released their 250 page report on things that we can do and elevating this idea of good fire and stewardship. Um, I think that this is a windfall event where things are going to start changing really rapidly. Um, and I think that this is one small part of that. There's so many people that are doing such good and important work in this. Um, but yeah, I think I think I will say yes. I will say yes. And so much of that involves just changing how we can imagine ourselves in this space. 